unfortunately, to hook it to that computer, I then I have to put it on a. Uh, gotcha. Uh, so I'll tell you so why why don't we wing it with this one? Because I think you're yeah. familiar with this one, and uh, yeah, let me we'll, introduce. We'll, we'll do it with that one, and I'll just move fast through those slides that you uh, deemed unnecessary. Okay. So let me uh, let me introduce this thing and uh, let the okay. folks know here what we're planning on doing. So. First of all, good evening, everybody. A little bit of a technology challenge here. I'm sure it's uh, operator error, but uh, anyway. Um, so we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. So what we are going to do is we have a presentation by uh, Roberto Al uh, Baltanato from uh, the Small Business Administration. I had also asked, and initially he had committed, uh, Hub Harvey, who is the Shelby County Director of the Emergency Management Agency, Shelby County's Emergency Management Agency, and Hub sent me an email at the last minute and said uh, he wasn't going to be able to make it. So the purpose was to uh, explain to everybody what types of relief assistance is available uh, for the tornadoes of March 25th. Now we put out some information that uh, Roberto had sent us uh, and some information from FEMA on our website and on our Facebook page, but the, there's a little banner that goes across that is not correct. And, and the point is, is FEMA has uh, partners that uh, provide assistance of various kinds. And that banner, when it talks about the Small Business Administration, basically says that, that that assistance is for small businesses only. It is not. It is for individuals as well. And Roberto, I'm sure, is going to talk to that. So uh, I'm going to read you the email that Hub Harvey sent me. Then I'm going to turn it over to Roberto for his uh, presentation. And then we'll take, you know, five minutes or so for any questions that you might have of Roberto uh, from the SBA. Then what we'll do is we will uh, convene the council meeting. Uh, we'll try to go through that as quickly as we can. And as you know, there is a, uh, a section at the end of the council meeting agenda that uh, allows for public comments and questions. So during the council meeting, during the uh, mayor's report section of it, I'm going to talk about the things that the city is doing, is not doing, would like to do as far as uh, disaster relief and probably a little bit of redundancy from what uh, Hub Harvey's email is going to say as well as what Roberto is going to say. So I'm going to just read you uh, Hub's email. Uh, he's, he says, I, I'll not be able to attend tonight's meetings. Uh, Residents are encouraged to sign up for FEMA individual assistance. Now, I want to clarify that FEMA has two levels of assistance. They have individual assistance and they have public assistance. Individual assistance is what you have to ask FEMA for. Public assistance is what uh, municipalities, government agencies, etc. ask FEMA for. Um, there's a lower threshold to achieve uh, the individual assist assistance. And as you would expect, what you get is less than what is available for public assistance. Right now, the state of Alabama has not received public assistance from FEMA, only individual assistance. The, um, the uh, uh, governor has asked for an extension from uh, April 25th, which was 30 days after the tornado, uh, to get a 30-day extension for us to put in the uh, damage assessments, and hopefully uh, there will be uh, public assistance available, which would certainly help the city of Columbiana and the state to help out. So going back to Hub's email, residents are encouraged to sign up for individual assistance, that's individuals and households, from the March 25th tornadoes for items such as housing assistance, rental help, uninsured damages, etc. Between now and June 25th, so you have to get, you have to sign up between now and June 25th. I printed some, uh, a little flyer up here. If we don't have enough, we'll, we'll print some more uh, that talks about the FEMA assistance. Residents can apply online by going online to disasterassistance.gov. You can call FEMA. There's two toll-free phone numbers here. 
This information is available on our website and I believe also on our Facebook page. And then see the flyer. The flyer is the color one. I don't know exactly which one that one is. I think that's the presentation mm -hmm. from SBA. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Hub says, in talking with FEMA on Friday, private property debris removal will not be approved for the March 25th tornadoes. Shelby County Landfill will accept any brush or vegetative debris delivered by the city of Columbiana. So that's what we will pick up uh, until uh, it's complete. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the uh, actual formal council meeting and when we get into the public comment section afterwards. So without further ado, Roberto, I'm going to uh, let you uh, speak now and I'm going to make sure I got your volume turned up since we're doing this uh, and, and you can go for it. So well, hang, hang on just a second. Hang on just a second. We've got some late folks coming in. So let me let them get seated before you get started. And while they do that, I'm going to read your help since uh, you have that presentation on there. Whomever is manipulating the, the presentation now, indeed. That's me. On the second slide, and then the person can do the next slide. Yeah. We can start on that one right there. Yeah, that's me. Uh, so uh, let these folks get in here and, and get seated. And uh, yes. Yes. we're going to run out of those, I think. Are we? Okay. So Mayor, you're my co-pilot. Yep. Well, um, Roberto, I'm an old fighter pilot, and I'm used to being in the plane alone. So. Uh. So then I'm your co-pilot. <laughs> you're the pilot. You'll be piloting in terms of the presentation. Whenever I say next slide, you can just move it to the next one, and I'll. I can do that. The timing. Uh, I will. Uh, I'll concentrate on the ones that apply the most okay. for your. So folks, uh, I apologize, we don't have better audio than this, but uh, we're going to try to, so, so try to be quiet as a mouse, listen up, and we'll go ahead. And so, I, I stepped in closer to my computer to make sure that my voice is a little clearer. Yeah. So, so again, my name is Robert Bantulano, I'm a public affairs, affairs specialist with the Office of Disaster Assistance at the Small Business Administration, and that's ODA, and that's basically that first line that you see on that slide. It's who we are. The reason I highlight the fact that uh, we are the Office of Disaster Assistance is because the Small Business Administration is there to provide services to, small, to the small business community on a daily basis. And so we hope that those small business owners who are either in attendance today or are going to view this presentation later um, know that we are a free federal resource for those who are already in business in a small business environment or those who are thinking of opening a small business. If you have an idea, you bring that idea over to the Small Business Administration, we help you with writing a business plan, uh, filing in for a um, loan at a bank, and if the bank decides to support your idea, the Small Business Administration will guarantee that loan. That is what we do for you on a day-to-day -day basis. When a disaster strikes, the Office of Disaster Assistance at the SBA kicks in. And so that is what I'm going to explain to you next. What uh, available programs and services do we have in response to both the January and March tornadoes, understanding that March is the main concern for your community. Last but not least, I'm going to walk you through how to apply. I'll go ahead and review a little bit of what the mayor shared with you a moment ago in regards to SEMA and how the two organizations come into play and the importance of applying with both. And I'll explain that to you. And last but not least, We'll open it for a question and answer session in the event anyone has a, a sum. So, Mayor, if I may move to the next slide. Thank you. And so, in essence, the Small Business Administration Office of Disaster Assistance has been operating since the 1950s. We were created by Congress, and our mission is to provide you, the homeowner, the renter, and the business owner, with affordable, long-term, low-interest disaster loans uh, for you, for the business of all sizes, private nonprofit organizations, homeowners, and renters to be able to repair or replace real estate, personal property, that includes all of the goods you see either inside of your business or inside of your home, your furniture, your car. Um, homeowners also can, or business owners rather, can repair or replace machinery, equipment, inventory, 
and business assets. And that is basically those items that may have been destroyed by the declared disaster, in this case, the tornadoes from January and March. If you can go to the next slide, skip it, just move on to the next one after that. We're not going to cover that one there. Thank you. And so what we do, we do it in coordination with other agencies, starting with the local emergency management and then moving on to the local government as it is today with your council meeting is how we get to the fiber of the community in order to A, share information, and two, identify needs. Once those needs are identified, the program is put out there and announced. And then a group of individuals or organizations come into play to help you, starting with our regional offices and our district offices. There is a district office in Alabama. It is located in Birmingham. If you Google SBA Birmingham, you will get not only their phone number or their address. You can also go to sba.gov, and our website is at the bottom of that slide. You can reach out also to the Small Business Development Center are known as SBDCs, Women Business Center, or SCORE, which is a group of volunteer retired professionals. Any one of these groups, whether it is our district office, SBDC, the WBC, or SCORE, can help you reconstruct financial records, prepare your financial statements, and or complete the application completely free. All of the services that I'm explaining to you today here programs, and even the financing of the loan is completely free. There are no costs associated with any of this as it is federal assistance. These groups also provide you, once your loan has been either approved, declined, or withdrawn, and I'm going to explain what those two terms are, we, or the group that I mentioned to you, can help you then uh, provide assistance through the life of that loan if it's been approved. If it's been declined, we help you understand why was it declined? And the fact that you have the right to three appeals in the first six months after that declination letter. So, once you fulfill, when you complete your application, we encourage you to make sure that you have the correct name of the business or the individual, as it appears on your ID if you're applying as an individual, um, the full address including zip code, a valid phone number, and a valid email account. Those items are typically one of the main reasons why applications are declined, because we couldn't validate your identity as a business or as an individual, and so your application is declined. It's not the end of the world. It means you need to come back to us and correct that information. So your application goes into a withdrawal state. It, is, it sits there for six months. So you have up to six months from the moment you get that declination letter to call us back or write back to us and either correct the information or appeal. If indeed the declination involves a final decision, you can appeal up to three times. Last but not least, these groups also provide you with counseling services for the life of your loan once you're approved. That is to help you <laughs> along the recovery process. We have to you on whether or not you need to take the entire loan, can you manage the entire loan at once, or do you need to take it in portions? Depending on your needs and the conversation you have, with the loan officer, we provide you with some free financial advisement to maximize that money, to make sure that when you grab that money out of the account, it goes to your recovery and not to unmet needs that you may not need to spend that money for. You are accountable for that. So to the next slide. And uh, if you can come back to one, you moved up a little too far. I think you moved to... Let me see which one you have. Okay, you need so, to go so, back. So this is the January tornado that I mentioned to you to take yep. out. Move, move to the March. There we go. Is that it? All right. So I'm going to mention the January tornadoes, even though we don't have much screen, just in case. Because both, uh, uh, your county was declared for both incidents. So if by any chance anyone who be listening was affected by the January tornado, you can apply to the FBA. FEMA does not apply for January because that was not a presidential declaration. March, however, as you can see on that very first bullet, is a presidential declaration, which means you have FEMA and SBA in addition to other organizations on the ground. As the mayor explained a few moments ago, FEMA offers you grants. That's money you don't have to pay back. What FEMA, however, is they provide assistance for you, either uh, as an individual, as a business owner, 
to be able to patch your home, to make it livable again, to fix a door, to fix a window, to patch your roof, <clears throat> for you to be able to fix your car, for you to be able to get back to your routine in life, and get back to work and get the economy going from that end. It is therefore immediate temporary needs. Up-term recovery, you can go through either your insurance, your savings, or consider an SBA disaster loan. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about. For this presidential declaration, we have two sets of counties. The primary counties, which is where the bulk of the construction occurred, and you can see them on screen, Bibb, Colhoun, Clay Hill, Jefferson, Perry, Randolph, and Shelby County. And it's the reason I'm speaking to the to the city council today, uh, and the adjacent counties are listed below. The first set of counties, the primary counties, are eligible for both physical property damage and economic injury disaster loans. What are physical property damage? The word basically explains it. Any physical property damage you may have received either in your business or your home. Again, a wall, a roof, a window, a door, anything that pertains to the structure of the business or the home, then you can apply for physical disaster loans to be able to start making those repairs even before you get the money from your insurance. So you may very well, if you had insurance, a file for insurance, but as we know, those processes take, long, take a little while sometimes, but you have to wait for that insurance money to come in in order to start making those repairs. You can very well apply for the FBA, Let's say your repairs are valued at fifty thousand. You get approved for that fifty thousand. You get the money from SBA and you start making your repairs. When your insurance money kicks in, you utilize those funds to repay the loan. But you already had brought to your recovery. You didn't have to wait for that insurance. That's one example. If you did not have insurance, more power to you to apply for the SBA. And we'll explain to you in the next few slides why is it that you should apply for a loan to get out of a disaster. Second, the adjacent counties are, are eligible only for the economic injury loan. And primary and adjacent can apply for economic injury loan, which is in essence working capital. So any of those businesses, any of any business who either suffer physical damage or had an interruption in business, whether it's because you closed your doors in the days or weeks following the disaster, or simply because your building was affected and you couldn't operate, and so you had a reduction in sales, you can apply for an economic injury disaster loan, which is working capital. It is basically money to be able to allow the business to maintain those commitments that keeps them running, paying the rent, the leasing of the equipment, the payroll of the employees, those things that would allow the business to stay afloat, even if you're not open yet, to be able to not close the business for good. The idea is to not only maintain, but recover the local economy. So again, recapping a little bit, primary counties, physical disaster, and economic injury loan, which is working capital for either businesses and or individuals. Individuals obviously do not need capital, working capital, only physical work <coughs> done. Uh, the next, the adjacent counties are eligible only for the working capital. So you must have not had any um, uh, physical disaster, uh, damage rather, but you can apply for the working capital to get the adjacent counties, including the, two, the three counties in Georgia. Important, and I'll move to the next slide next, is the filing deadlines. June 25th, the same deadline as FEMA, is the deadline for you to file an SBA physical property damage disaster loan application. In January the 26, 2022, is the date for you to file for economic injury being working capital. And we're going to revisit those in the next few slides. Next slide, please. Yeah, I think I got ahead of you. Is this okay? Okay, okay. So I said, why should you get into a disaster loan to be able to recover from a disaster? We're very different from what the standard banking loans are. Starting with how we qualify. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about credit. We'll look at your credit. However, credit is not the only thing we keep in mind in order to make a decision. Most importantly, we offer you, and I spoke about this at the beginning, affordable, long-term, low interest. The interest in this case for homeowners, for example, is as low as 1.25. For businesses of all sizes, is 3%, and nonprofit organizations is 2% for the physical property damage. 3% and 2% for businesses and nonprofit when applying for economic injury loan. If you look at the market rates today for loans, 
that's below market rate. In the case of homeowners, way below. Average is right now at three and a half to four percent. So that puts it in perspective. That's why we recommend you explore the avenue of a SBA disaster loan to be able to get you back on your feet if indeed you need that help. Our terms are also very flexible, and I'll explain to you about those the next on the next slide. So if we move on to the next slide, please. So I mentioned to you about physical damage for businesses. That again is to be able to replay or re repair rather or replace real estate, equipment, furniture, etc. Those goods inside the business that you need in order to operate. If your restaurant and your kitchen uh, was was damaged, to get that grill back on or to get that refrigerator back on, you have up to two million dollars of available credit, if you will, to apply for a physical damage disaster loan for businesses. Businesses, again, can apply for working capital. If that same restaurant that is now fixing their kitchen and their um, freezer, is, it needs money to be able to maintain those commitments, to pay their employees the rent, to the lease of those equipment that were affected, you can, again, apply for an economic injury loan. The combination of the two, physical damage and or economic injury loans, have a cap of $2 million. So you have to think about uh, how you're going or, or when applying, rather, keep that $2 million sitting in mind because that's going to be the combination of the two. Now, if you are a homeowner, you can apply for physical damage. Homeowners to, replay, to repair or replace personal, rather, real estate property. Again, FEMA gives you a grant to patch your home, to make it livable. We provide you with money for you to be able to repair it back to your new normal for that long-term recovery. By the same token, homeowners and renters can also apply mm -hmm. for contents, physical damage contents, to be able to repair or replace anything inside that home. Look around you, your TV, your computer, your bed, any goods around the house that you may have lost, including your automobile, can be repaired or replaced using a physical damage disaster loan. And homeowners have up to $200,000 for the combination of the two. Renters have up to $40,000 for physical damage to repair or replace contents. Now, if any one of you, whether you're a business uh, and or a homeowner, have an approved loan from SBA, you have access to mitigation funding. What do I mean by that? We want you to build we want you to rebuild stronger thinking of the next disaster because it's not a matter of if, but when the next tornado comes around. And so we want to make sure that, for example, your home is equipped with a safe room. That if you want to elevate the property to mitigate the effect of a flood, you are able to do that. If you want to install a sump pump, if you want to install hurricane shutters on your windows, we give you money for you to be able to mitigate the effects of the next disaster today. So if that is something that you'd like to do as part of your recovery, make sure you mention that on your application. Obviously, there's a comment. And with your loan officer, when you first hear from them, your loan officer, mention that in addition to repairing or replacing goods, you're interested in mitigation funding. And they're going to ask you about, you know, what exactly it is that you're looking for. If you're looking to raise the property, if you're looking to, again, strengthen your roof, for example, et cetera. That is up to 20% of the verified physical damage is what you've allowed. If you're a homeowner, you have to keep in mind that $200,000 cap. Important here to notice that if you approve for mitigation money, uh, rather for mitigation funding, fund cannot be used to upgrade or expand a business or to make additions to a home. It is for you to be able to strengthen your property for the next disaster. Okay. If you don't know whether or not you have exposure to disasters, we encourage you to reach out to your local emergency manager. They will explain to you if you live in a flood zone, for example, so you can then take into consideration elevating the property if you are indeed exposed to flood. Next slide, please. As I said before, eligibility and restrictions, we look at your credit. However, we don't look at it the same, the same way banking does. Even if you have gone into bankruptcy before or you have bad credit today, we will take your credit into consideration because what we're doing is we're using a combination of your credit and your current financial standing to establish your ability to repay. So, and I'll give you an example. I met a gentleman in Fultondale 
who was affected by the January tornado. He is a wedding videographer, and he lost his equipment. He applied for a $6,000 loan to replace your, his equipment, and he's paying $30, $30 a month. That is what his ability to repay was at the time we analyzed his conditions. That gives you a perspective. The idea here is to provide you with a line of credit for you to be able to get back on your feet, not asphyxiate you with a high monthly payment on a loan. So we're going to work with you, depending on your credit history and your ability to repay, to establish terms that are affordable to you, for you to be able to maintain those payments and get back on your feet. One thing I need to uh, add on here, only uninsured or otherwise uncompensated disaster-related losses. In other words, only that that was destroyed by either the January or the March tornado will be deemed eligible by this declaration. So if you had damages post-March or before January, they will not qualify. Okay? Secondary homes, location properties uh, may not be eligible. And I highlight the fact that may not because if you are an individual who owns two homes, you have your primary home and you have an apartment or a second home that you rent, may qualify that second property for a physical disaster loan, provided that you are able to prove that you use it for business purposes. For example, if you have a leasing agreement with a tenant that you can show that you have something in that house which paying for rent. If you have checks on which you can prove that they're paying for rent, then you are able to claim both your primary and secondary property if used for business purposes. An exception to that rule also is if you have that second home and a family member lives in that home who may not necessarily pay your rent. If you're able to prove that link between you and that person as an extended family member, you may also uh, qualify that second property for a physical disaster loan. Now, applicants who have not complied with the terms of a previous SBA loan, and that's, for example, somebody who was not able to maintain the payments, somebody who was not able to keep the insurance, and I'll speak about it on the next slide, uh, may not be eligible. And even then, we're still utilizing the word may. If for one reason or another, you already had an SBA loan, and you were not able to keep up with the payments, still apply, make sure you put that on your notes. You couldn't maintain payments. And then let's talk about the reason why. It could very well be that you were, you were affected by a subsequent disaster. And so what we do then, we restructure the first loan, out of the first one, work out the payment arrangement, Make sure that you're able to get back on your feet again. Very important. Next slide, please. And so now we speak about collateral and insurance. If you have a plan, if you're applying for a physical loan that is under twenty-five thousand, we're going to require collateral. Okay. If you're applying for an economic injury loan over twenty-five thousand, we're going to require collateral up to fifty thousand dollars of unsecured disaster loans when combined between the economic injury and the physical disaster loan. Now, when I say we're going to require, it means that we're going to ask you to pledge what's available. If you have a property that you can put up as a collateral, we're going to ask you to pledge it. However, we are not going to decline your loan because you don't have a collateral. You don't, if you don't have the ability to provide a collateral, that will be just fine. We only ask, to, ask you to pledge what's available when applying for these loans. Again, $25,000 each for you to keep in mind, whether it's under or over, depending on the, this, on the type of loan, physical and or economic injury loan. Now, if your property, if the collateral property or the damaged <coughs> property is in a special flood hazard area, and if you don't know, the local emergency manager can tell you, you will be required to purchase and maintain flood insurance. On the bottom of this slide, in red, you see a website, floodsmart.gov. Even if you don't apply today, even if you don't need a SBA, we encourage you to visit that website and explore how feasible and cheap it is for you to buy blood insurance today. That is the number one hazard we experience as a nation. And so we encourage you to go ahead and visit that website even if you don't think about applying to an SBA loan. If you apply for an SBA loan, then you must visit that website and consider purchasing a flood insurance policy. Next slide, please. So here I'm going to highlight some of the benefits. I spoke about low interest, no cost to apply, civil uh, terms up to 30 years. If you are a business with a credit available elsewhere, that means if you have 
uh, the ability to borrow money from a bank or somebody else, or if you have savings, and your terms may, and I say may because it depends on the case, may be limited to seven years. If not, you can extend those terms up to 30 years. As I said before, funds are available before the insurance settlement. The most important benefit here, which is at the second item at the top right corner column, is your first payment is not due until 18 months after you sign the promissory note. That is, I think, the biggest benefit that we can provide you. We give you a year and a half to be able to get that breathing space you need in order to start making payments, regardless of the payment amount. It could be $100 a month. And if you want to start now and you are able to, that's fine. You can do so. But if you want to wait a year and a half, you can do so with no penalties whatsoever. Um, obviously, then I spoke about mitigation funds, and we encourage you to consider that. But last but not least, and this is the item at the bottom right corner, the second column to the right, you have no obligation whatsoever to take the loan. So the difference is when you walk into a bank, there are fees associated, and you have an obligation if you are approved to take that loan, to take that loan. If you don't, obviously there are fees associated with declining the loan, not in our case. You can come in, apply for an SBA loan, go through the motions. If you're approved, you can hold that money. Think of it as your piggy bank, and you have it sitting there. If in the event your insurance money doesn't come in, for example, you know you have access to that SBA loan, and you can grab that money. You can grab it in portions. All you need out of the 50000 that you may have been approved is 5000 to repair your car. Or if you need only 25000 you can get that. If you want to use that money as a mitigation project that takes six months to complete you take it in segments as your project progresses and there are no fees or penalties in doing that that is the level of flexibility no interest affordable terms and the ability for you to take or not the loan very important next slide please and here is the most important um, slide so we have two groups the january and the march uh, tornado if you were affected by January, you do not need to complete step one. You go to apply with SBA. If you are affected by March, which I, it's the majority of the people listening today, first, you need to register with FEMA by visiting disasterassistance.gov. Download the FEMA <coughs> call to the friends of FEMA at 1-800-621-3362. As the mayor explained at the beginning of this presentation, FEMA is offering those grants, and you have to apply or re register with FEMA. Now, we also encourage you to apply with the SBA, even if you don't need a loan, because getting declined by the SBA expedites the grants from FEMA. That is very important for you to know. It's basically how the disaster uh, assistance, federal disaster assistance work. FEMA is going to ask you, as part of your application, to apply for an SBA loan. Don't let that discourage you. Remember that most people, when they first say that, they say, well, FEMA wants me to take on an obligation and they're not giving me any grants. They will. They just want you to do what's right, which is apply with SBA and consider that loan. Remember, you don't have any obligation to take the loan even if approved. And if you are declined by the SBA, you're automatically qualified for the FEMA grant. Very important for you to keep that in mind. Also, if you get the FEMA grant, but you have what we call unmet needs, which is down the road, you realize that you needed, to have, you needed to have an additional $3,000 to be able to fix that back room. But you don't have the money. You have that SBA loan pre-approved ahead of time that is sitting in the background where you can tap into and grab those $3,000 if indeed you have that need. You can reach out to us at sba.gov forward slash disaster or by calling us any day of the week, seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. at 1-800-659-2955. That is our virtual disaster loan outreach center. That's a mouthful. But that is because of COVID. We're not physically visiting you today in your town. Typically, I would be in, the, in that room speaking to all of you in person. But because of COVID, obviously, we're safely from home. And so we want to make sure that you know we're only a click or a phone call away. And you have that information in there and on their flyer that the mayor just distributed earlier. And at the bottom, then you have the filing deadlines. I included January just in case there is anyone here who is planning on applying for the January assistance, look at the difference in due dates. If you're applying for January physical property damage, it's June the 1st. 
if you're applying for March, physical property damage is June the 25th. So beginning mm -hmm. and end of the month, and by the same token, if you're applying for working capital for January, it's January the 3rd, 2022. And for the March tornadoes, working capital is January the 26th, 2022. Want to move on to the next slide? There are basically recap some of the phones and websites that I spoke mm -hmm. about. But most importantly, I want to leave you with the, pre the preparedness website. Even if you think you're prepared, we encourage you to visit ready to go business or ready to go plan and review your plans. There's mm -hmm. always something that you may have forgotten, and we encourage you to do that. Plus, we have these visit floods.gov. And the next slide, uh, Mayor, will then open it up for questions if you have your hand up. Okay. Roberto, good job of uh, sort of winging it there. I appreciate your help on that. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to uh, change the view where um, just you uh, or who can be seen. And I'm going to turn you around so that uh, you can see our, our lovely uh, gallery here. And hopefully that will help you some. Can you see? Everybody's waving. Yeah, I can see everybody. Okay. So what I'm going to do is uh, open it up for questions, and I'll be the moderator here. So if anybody's got a question of Roberto, I've got a gentleman over here, so on the end. Well, I'll uh, leave him alone and get it. You know, you, I have to tell you what it's for, right? He said if I apply for the FEMA loan, the FEMA doesn't give loans. This would be an SBA no, loan. Too. Right, let me explain. And that is a good question because it puts everything in perspective. And thank you for the question. So remember, register. Notice the keyword. You're registering with FEMA. You're not applying with FEMA. Register with FEMA because they have a grant, which is money you don't pay back. They will give you money to fix that door, fix that window, patch your room, fix your car for you to be able to get back to work and get the economy going. And then apply with FBA. Even if you don't think of if you, if you don't think you need any money with SBA, apply with SBA because by getting the client with SBA, you expedite the free money that comes from you. But can that money be used to remove tree debris, root balls from my property? No, and I won't speak for FEMA because I'm not FEMA, but I can tell you from experience, FEMA money is for immediate needs. Again, that's to be able to make your home livable. That is the key phrase. Make your home livable. If it is in terms of removal of debris, then you come either to SBA or through the county, and the mayor explained to you how at this time a public assistance is not available. Uh, however, that is something that the authorities at the state level and the federal level are working together with. My recommendation is, and this is for you to consider, you may apply for an SBA loan to be able to remove those things, wait for that either the insurance or the public assistance, if not, then at least you have an avenue for you to be able to solve these needs at this point. Keep in mind, these are low interest loans. Then you have that year and a half to pay, and you don't have to take the loan if at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the day you don't feel comfortable. But you applied and you went through the motions, and guess what? You'll learn towards the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? And I yes, can ma yes ma'am. Anyway, also, just in case. Pardon? Mayor. I can also answer questions in Spanish. If yeah, so if you need to ask a question in Spanish, will you translate for us, Roberto? Yes, of course. So, okay, so that was my next question. There's a lot of people here that don't speak English. So how will they go about it, trying to get some information and how to get with other people about it? Can you tell me what All right, so basically, Shed, uh, we have a lot of folks here who are non-English speakers. And she wanted to know how they would go about getting information and applying for a loan for non-English speakers. Uh, and so I'm going to make a, a quick mention to it in Spanish. If I may, I'm going to switch to Spanish. Para aquellos que hablan español, si ustedes, si hay, en, para los, los afectados a los, a los tornados de marzo, ustedes tienen dos avenidas. FEMA, que es un grant, es dinero básicamente gratis, que es FEMA le da dinero para reparar su casa, hacerla otra vez, habitable, de manera que puedan reparar una, una pared, una, una puerta, una ventana o reforzar su techo para poder seguir viviendo en esa casa. SBA de ayuda es con un préstamo a bajo interés, tan bajo como el 1.125% pagadero a 30 años para completar esas reparaciones que lo vuelvan a poner en una situación normal. 
y eso incluye los contenidos de su casa, los muebles, el televisor, la computadora y su carro. I just explained to them basically how the combination of FEMA grants and SBA loans basically coming together, one, to provide immediate needs, to fix or patch your home to make it livable, that's FEMA, and SBA loan with interest as low as 1.125 for homeowners mm -hmm. and renters to make those long-term repairs that will allow you to, win, to, to keep living in that property. Okay. Got another question here. Yes, ma'am. What if you apply, for example, we're having a long term with our insurance. Could you speak up a little bit, please? Soft voice. I know. Um, we're having trouble with the adjusters of bid and the offstage people. Um, or, I'm sorry, the offstage adjuster and the contractor. They're way, way apart. So, what if you apply for this loan and as a personal for the house? And you get approved, but your Allstate or your insurance company, whatever it may be, may be does not meet the level of, of the how much they're giving you. Did you? Well, I think I heard. I heard the second half of the question, but if I heard, it's basically a scenario where uh, your homeowner have your insurance policy, and your concern is, what if your insurance policy doesn't make you whole? Right. Is that? That's it. Correct. <laughs> So let's utilize an example. Let's say your damage is valued $100,000 for the sake of conversation. And you need $100,000 to repair your home. However, your insurance only steps up with $80,000. That's why we encourage you to register with FBA, register with FEMA and apply with FDA. If you do that now, you would have had that $20,000 credit available for you if you were indeed approved. For when that insurance comes in and you know that you're short, 20,000, then you can come back to the SBA and say, SBA, out of the 50,000 that you approved me, I'm only going to take 20 because that is the gap. And that is how we refer to that. That is an insurance gap. So it is important. Again, that's why we, again, don't charge a fee uh, for you to apply. And if you are approved, we don't charge a penalty for you to withdraw the loan. So apply for that loan, particularly if you have that concern with insurance. To make sure that at least you have a safety net. In the event your insurance comes short, you have then that safety net to come back to, and you have six months from the, from the date the loan is approved for you to come back and say, Mr. SBA, this is how much I need. So you don't have to grab any money right off the bat. You can wait six months until your insurance replies for you to be able to determine whether or not you need the SBA money. Voy a explicar eso en español. I'm going to briefly say that in Spanish because that is important, Mr. Mayor. Si usted es dueño de casa y tiene seguro, y su seguro, por ejemplo, no le cubrió los gastos completos, supongamos que sus gastos son de 100 mil dólares, y el seguro le dio solamente 80 mil dólares, es ahí la importancia de por qué le pedimos aplique a un préstamo de SBA. Porque esos 20 mil dólares los tiene reservados con SBA. Cuando el seguro, si cuando el seguro le pague, le da solo los 80 de los 100 que usted necesita, usted viene a SBA y entonces toma los 20 mil dólares que necesita. 
he ahí la, la importancia de entonces registrarse con FEMA y aplicar con ese tema. That's a really good question because it is a very typical scenario, Mr. Mayor. Another typical scenario is, coming back to the lady in the insurance example, you don't have money for that insurance deductible. If that is all you need, you can apply for that insurance deductible through the SBA. If you need, let's say, $10,000 to be able to pay the deductible and get your insurance premium, that is what we can help you. By the same token, if all you need is $500 to repay your car and get back to work, you can come to the SBA to get those $500 to repay your car and get back to work. So that, again, the, the, the idea here is there is no other is a cap, $2 million for business, $200,000 for homeowners, and $40,000 for renters, there is minimum. You can apply for as low as $500 to repay your car, or $20,000 to meet that insurance cap, or take the full $100,000 if that is what you need. Okay, uh, Robert? I'm sorry, but you still have to pay back. You can't get your insurance company into your contract. That's correct. You're still going to owe the difference mm -hmm. for the tip tech, correct? You will owe what you borrow. Her, her question was, if you can't get the, the difference, would you still have to pay it back? And I think the message is, is you would only borrow what you need. You can get approved for more, but at, but apply. yeah, apply. Apply for the, the $200,000. Yeah. If approved for the 200000 you don't have to take the 200000 If at the end of the day, all you need is 10000 out of that $200,000 approval, you grab the 10000 and that's it. You don't have to. Uh, take, you're not obligated to take any money whatsoever, right. any a portion of it if you want. Cool. Then if you want, at the end of the day, you can turn around and walk away and not take any money. And you don't owe anybody anything. Okay, Roberto, we're going to have to cut off the, the questions right here. We're going to move into our regular council meeting. And during that council meeting, during the mayor's discussion, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about tornado relief. And at the end of the council meeting, we opened it up for public comment. You are welcome to stay if you like, uh, or you can. Uh, you can. I'm happy to hang around and yes, in case anybody has questions. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute you, and uh, uh, not that we don't like listening to you, but I think <laughs> it, it would just be work out better. And and you will be able to. I will mute myself as well. Yeah, we'll. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I muted me. <laughs> Whatever you say now, I can mute you. I, I muted me instead of you, so you can mute yourself. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start our regular council meeting at this time. It's about uh, 10 minutes to 7, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. So I'd like to ask uh, Councilman Rustin to lead us in our invocation. Sure. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we thank you for all that you've given us this week, Lord, the things we can see, and maybe the things we cannot. Lord, we thank you for your grace, and uh, we thank you for your mercy, Lord. Ask the Lord to speak with the meeting tonight, do the things that are discussed, be, continue to be with our city. Um, the people that protect it and the people that make it go on a day-to-day -day basis. God, I ask you, Lord, just to be with the citizens in the city, God, and as we go through this time, time, uh, natural disasters, Lord, I ask you, Lord, just let us get some answers, um, let us get them back to our lives together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. We've moved the flag on you in the back, so if you could stand, if you're able to stand. Attention. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. And I'll ask the city clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Lilly? Here. Mazel? Here. Rustin? Here. King? Here. Phillips? Here. Mayor Mitchell? Here. And we have a quorum. So I'll let you all take a quick look at the agenda. I'm not going to read it all to you, but uh, it's a fairly busy agenda, but we're going to try to get through it fairly quickly and try to stick to uh, as much time as possible on uh, tornado relief.
So first item is uh, approval of the consent agenda. So if there are no uh, additions, deletions, or corrections to the minutes of the last regular council meeting, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'd like to make that motion. I'll second. And all in favor? Okay, motion's approved. Okay, we're gonna, we normally uh, have two council meetings a month Half of our departments give a report uh, one at one meeting, the other half of the departments do it at another meeting. We're going to do this very, very quickly today. So um, I don't see Chief mm -hmm. Howard here. So basically, um, he's got pretty much uh, his standard report. Everything's pretty good shape. He's got uh, some uh, routine maintenance requirements on his equipments and, and tools. He's concerned about his daily staffing. We have a volunteer fire department, so obviously he, he feels like he needs more folks. The fleet is aging, and that is something that we're trying to address. And the facility, we've talked a lot about uh, a possible second location. The ISO auditors, uh, that's the Insurance Services Office, which is an independent agency that rates uh, municipalities as far as their fire coverage, and it affects all of your um, or potentially affects all of your homeowner's insurance was due to have an audit and I think they had to postpone that audit. So I don't, I don't know if they ever showed up or not. But, um, so uh, library, uh, Sheila, looks like uh, staffing is the only issue that you have and that's anything. Let's really it be okay, so you're all green. No, I mean, we, we could use somebody else, but Oh, you're talking about it's not yeah. trending downward, it's mm -hmm. flat. Okay, very good. So the library is back open, uh, and so I encourage everybody to, to utilize the library. Uh, environmental services, uh, Chris is here. I think Dale's uh, absence. Uh, sewer lines, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, and I'll ask you to, to bring that up. And What about the training? Training we went good and uh, we went to Mobile and we also we learned that uh, they're going to be um, separating the continuing education hours. Previously it had to be like 24 hours for each certification, and uh, we learned that if you if you hold two certifications, for instance, if you was uh, like Dale to grade four, or grade three, and then the collection guy, you used to could just go to one class and get your C, your C. DHs, but now they make you separate them. So they're going to cut them down instead of 24. If they cut them down, it's going to make you get 15 hours. Okay. So that'd be a lot better than, you know. Yeah, so they split them apart business. and cut yes. the hours down. Yes. That actually makes sense. Yes, it? It That's a lot better. <laughs> All, right. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about the sewer uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, senior Center, real quick, Allie, just. Uh, yeah, everything's going really well. We've opened sort of softly for exercise programs, um, and then hopefully by the end of May, the state will broaden that. Okay. All righty. So board, beautification board, besides, is anybody here from the beautification board besides uh, Kim? And Kim's been on vacation. So everything is beautiful. Has there been, <laughs> yes, there we go. Have there been any more beautiful. board meetings uh, since our last council meeting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not a picture of Mooney Road there. No, That's not a picture of uh, Deborah Drive. Okay. Um, so that we need to pass a resolution to get a alcohol alcoholic beverage license for the Old Mill Square. In the event that we have either public or private events uh, at the Old Mill Square in the Grand Hall uh, that would require uh, an alcoholic beverage service. And we have this uh, organization. Charlene, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Green and Walt? Um, is anybody here from the Oh, there you are. Okay. I didn't get to meet you before. I'm sorry. Um, and I'm sorry. I forgot your name. I'm Jonathan. Jonathan. Um, and so this is uh, Greenwalt Hospitality, but it is B&B Beverage Management. Um, and they have a lot of venues that you guys... We do. We, we manage or hold licenses for about 17 venues across the state. 
Um, and so this is just to get the um, ABC license uh, for Old Mill Square for um, any um, shows that the Arts Council has, anything going on in the Grand Hall, if there's private weddings, um, anything like that, any alcohol sales would go through this company. So therefore, uh, a council resolution is required in order for us to uh, move forward with the alcoholic beverage license. So is there a motion that we uh, approve the ABC license for Green and Walt Hospitality? Mr. Mayor, I make a um, proposal that we accept resolution 052101 ABC license for Green and Walt Hospitality, LLC. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. And and, well, I have to do a roll call since it's ABC oh, license. Okay. Roll call. Mm -hmm. um, Council Member Lilly? Yes. Uh, Myzel? Yes. Rustin? Yes. King? Yes. Phillips? Yes. Mayor Mitchell? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I get a copy of the resolution. Um, I have to do a letter saying that, yes, the resolution passed, send it back to the ABC board. Mm -hmm. They do their thing. They contact those guys again, and then in several weeks to a month, then we'll be ready to go. And that's all for right? That's on premise, yes. That's on premise. Mm -hmm. So I will begin back with you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I think we've mentioned this at a previous council meeting where uh, we at the City of Columbiana did not have our city ordinances codified. We, we maintained an ordinance book, and consequently it was uh, sometimes quite challenging to be able to find an ordinance because they weren't codified in such a manner that would allow you to easily search through that ordinance book to find them. So we uh, contracted with an agency that codified our ordinances. Um, they are now available on the uh, city website, I believe. As soon as we pass this. As soon as we pass this, they'll be so available tomorrow, on the city website. Tomorrow, tomorrow. And, uh, and as fate would have it, in order to codify the city ordinances, you have to pass an ordinance to do that. To codify the ordinances. Uh, so that's what this is, and I do not expect any of you to read all of this stuff, but basically... Um, it, it, it's all here should you decide to do that. So is there a, uh, a motion to pass Ordinance 52102? Mr. Mayor, I make a recommendation. We uh, accept ordinate, Ordinance 052102 is codified in the ordinance for, ordinances for the City of Columbia. Second. Okay. And do we need to roll call on this one or just show of hands? We can do show of hands. Show of hands, please. All right, so other business. We've talked to several times about uh, refunding the city's debt. Um, the, when we started this process, uh, the objective was to reduce our debt service payments annually uh, quite a bit, by about $40,000 a year. We had the option. We could have taken... Uh, at that time, uh, up to a million dollars in cash or no increase in debt payments, no change in terms of the loan, or we could uh, reduce our annual debt service by $40,000 a year. The um, interest rates, uh, treasury rates, have increased uh, since we started this process. We had to go through an Amendment 772 process, which we've talked about. I won't go into that, but that took some time. And so now we're down to having available $550,000 worth of cash and maybe only $20,000, and it could all change between now and the time we decide to close this. The Amendment 772 process was approved by the court. The appeal period uh, has lapsed, and so we're able to move forward with this debt refunding. We need to make a decision as a city as to whether or not we'll take cash or whether or not we will reduce our uh, debt service by $10,000 a year. We had a, a work session where we discussed this. We also have uh, almost a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of cash, which is uh, leftover revenue that was uh, obligated for the Old Mill uh, Square development. Uh, that, however, is committed to the Old Mill Square. This refunding process would repurpose that money to where it would go into the general fund and could be used for any purpose. So that would potentially give us up to $200,000 to use for capital projects. I should say that the Amendment 772 monies of about $550,000 uh, 
must on, can only be used on capital projects, the 180,200, whatever the number is, of Old Mill, fund square, uh, Old Mill Square funds could be used for any purpose. So uh, that's a decision the council has not made yet. I just wanted to give you an update. Um, and when we do, we'll have to come back to uh, the council for approval on how we're gonna spend that money. Uh, town hall meeting, uh, planning on having a town hall meeting on uh, June the 15th. We will do that in conjunction with our regularly scheduled city council meeting. We're gonna have it at the Grand Hall at the Old Mill Square. We really would like for you to talk it up, publicize it. We're gonna, you're gonna hear from all of your council members. You'll hear from all of our department heads. You'll hear what's going on in the city in uh, excruciating detail. Uh, we'll, we'll try to make it uh, somewhat entertaining, but we'll give you more information on that. So put that on your calendar. Uh, recreation facilities. Um, we have talked about um, the need for upgrades to various recreation facilities. Uh, we've talked about uh, installing some basketball goals in various locations around town. We've talked about the potential need for other recreation facilities. We did have a group uh, come to us uh, concerned about uh, the girls softball facilities and and I guess the condition and uh, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for but those facilities weren't as good as the boys baseball facilities so what I'm going to do is uh, ask that uh, the recreation board take up that topic uh, we will uh, get those concerned citizens to talk to the recreation board I think there's some things we can do as a city to improve both recreation facilities and, and to address, there were other concerns about the softball facilities, more than just the fields, but the safeties and concerns and concessions and things like that. And I think there's things we can do. Um, paving and wastewater sewer upgrades. So uh, we do have some projects to pave uh, Main Street as well as uh, Mildred Street. And I thought I'd let Alan talk about uh, what the plan is there when that's uh, supposed to happen. All right. <clears throat> the last the last conversation I had with the county, what they were planning on doing is they was hoping to already be working on it. So I wanted to put them behind on replacing some of their cover pipes down 47 in different areas. And Wiregrass has got the contract, and Wiregrass will not move in here to the county. It's ready for them to come because the city ourselves, we're piggybacking off the county's contract to get it at a cheaper rate. If we call Wiregrass in to start on our stuff now, we'll have to pay an activation fee where if we wait till the county does it, they pay for all that up front, and all we're doing is paying for the material that we use. So the last conversation I had with Clay, there. It could be by the end of May, or it could be sometimes in June. Our plans is is plan is paved in North Main from the top of the hill at Browns to the water shop that where the county's apron starts, and they're going their plans is to pay 47 all the way to the river, Mooney Road to Main, because that is a county road. Mooney Road's a county road out that way, and we're going to do Pitts Drive, Thompson Street. Then uh, following here on this coming up budget, we're going to put all the side streets on Mooney Road on it and stuff to pay them to bring them back up the way they need to be. The projects we got going on now is a little over $300,000 doing this little bit of paving that we're doing now. And that's using the tax money that we've collected off the of gas tax and we have to spend it every year on some kind of paving project. Plus the, past, the council and the mayor in the past that have proved so much money into the budget. So right now we're looking at about three hundred twenty-five to three hundred thirty thousand dollars on those projects, and planning on it. And this, like I said, in this next budget there'll be some more roads in there, feed in there, and it's going to run about the same every time we do it. If paving is not cheap, but the county is saving us a chunk of money by letting us piggyback off them. And that includes new striping of what they paid in and everything. They made new striping put out and everything, which will fix all the bad places in town down North Main Street now. Tomorrow night I've got a water board meeting. I'm going to ask the water board to go back 
And since we're not getting it paved as soon as we thought we was, and patch those holes back right. with asphalt instead of keep putting gravel back in them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is what I is my plans for tomorrow night. Hopefully they'll get started and get it done as quickly as they can and everything. Who did you say after Pitts? Thompson. Thompson, Pitts Drive, North Main, mm -hmm. to the water department. And, but not still. And Mildred Street. Oh, thank you. And Mildred Street. Mm -hmm. I've got a question. Huh? I've got to ask about Mildred Street. So if people are interested in doing, I guess it's their sewer line of rush from their house, tapping in, are redoing that line from their house to the main? They need to do it They before. need to do it before. Okay. No. Waste sewer? Waste yes. Water. Yes. Yes. So I, yes. Yeah, I knew that answer, but I just want to clarify. Yeah. Yes. You said they had that. roads on Monday, too. That'd be on the next be budget. Budget. Okay. Next budget. And yeah. if they do that, a good timeline, they need to do it by June. Yeah, they need to do it in the next two or three yeah. weeks, for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. But they need to understand that everybody does it and everything, that they need to put asphalt back into those mm -hmm. holes after they pack that gravel in there and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody got any questions for Alan? <coughs> okay. Chris, uh, so we do have a, a sewer upgrade project. We received a, uh, a grant from the state of Alabama for $450,000. Total project is just under seven hundred thousand dollars. I don't know the exact number, so the city pays the difference. Um, so, Chris, why don't you tell us about the sewer upgrade? Okay, uh, the upgrade we're working on right now is going to start in front of U.S. Bank, and um, what we're going to do is going to increase the pipe size to a twenty inch. We're going to cut the pavement at the bank, and we done already sent out easement papers and letters to each one of the people that it's going to affect. And uh, everybody seemed to be on board with it. And it's going to cut through and go behind Napa and cut across 25 by the uh, cornhole spot. And it's crossing the road to the tire place where William Patterson is. And uh, everything's going good. And so once we get that in, that would eliminate a lot of water problems we have in our them manholes. It should take that water in. Bring it on to the plant. So the flooding that we had in that area with the recent rain, did this help that? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it would, but no, sir. No, sir. It just helped us underground, not with no top of the ground. All right. So, the, but that that flooding wasn't caused by any stuff coming out of those sewers. No, right? no, sir. No, sir. That was just the creeks and the low places. Just six inches of rain fell too fast. And on uh, on 25, uh, we're going to be boring underneath the highway, right? We yes, won't be cutting the We will be boring underneath, and uh, the, the, the sewer line we have now, the previous sewer line, we'll have to concrete them under 25 according to the state you know, regulations and stuff. We have to concrete those pipes so the roads won't settle in the future and stuff. So, um, like I said, I think it would be great that we've been needing this project Long, 14, 15 yeah. years back. Okay. Yeah. Do you know where those two? Those two. Um, well, I yeah, I do. Yeah, where is That's that? my driveway right is it there. Really? Okay. <laughs> That's my mailbox. Okay. That, that is old Highway 25, right. and the road is all the water is almost completely across the road, and this is Frank Owen's uh, driveway, and the, the water just washed. Uh, completely underneath his driveway, all the, the soil around wow. his, his pipe there. Okay. And so he's That's not able to use his driveway right there. I'm, no, glad, all, I'm, I'm glad I all, missed when that. We had, when did we have those floods? Last that Tuesday. Was last Tuesday. Tuesday. Last Tuesday. I saw a day on Wednesday, and I think to, to butt off what the mayor said, he was excited. You know, we did a lot of sewer upgrades the last, I guess, eight years, nine years. You know, you mentioned that water. He said that y'all didn't have any alarms call for capacity that day. We did. So that that's a success story. I don't think many people, you know, you see all the water on top of the ground, but, you know, obviously their manhole didn't trigger anything. So that, mm -hmm. that lets you know that those sewer upgrades are working. Right. So we had a lot of that infiltration. And it's not in the roads. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is a good thing. Yeah. So I uh, think that's a good success story that you don't see. People don't talk about sewer all the time. Because we, we. Until it ranked. I remember us talking about it when we started doing it, and it was we always said, well, that's one of those ugly projects nobody's going to care about, but yep. so care. we care about it. All 
All right, so the last bullet on this uh, chart deals with stormwater concerns, not wastewater sewers, but stormwater, and that was the reason why those pictures, I tried to get some more, but at the time didn't let me, I wanted to get the Piggly Wiggly parking lot and, and the area down there at the intersection of uh, 70 and 25, but um, I, I got a lot of calls. You know, uh, I get calls uh, normally for uh, garbage pickup, here lately, I get a lot of calls about the storm debris, debris pickup, and naturally, right after the rain, I got a lot of calls about the stormwater, and it's a valid concern, and um, the city, frankly, does not have a plan on how to deal with stormwater issues, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because I got some potentially good news today that might help us with that. And my point is, is we, we need to develop a plan to figure out how we're going to deal with this. For example, when we paved Mildred Street, Mildred Street has a lot of issues with stormwater. We are going to mill that street down to help, hopefully, with some of the stormwater issues that we have on Mildred Street. But uh, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, it's unfortunate that you have to have uh, a frog strangling rain to... to remind you that we need to develop a plan on how we're going to deal with stormwater in the city of Columbia. So uh, we're, that's something that we'll be taking up as a city. I, and I don't know what the answers are yet, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we were going to address that issue. And, and my wife is saying that we have to. That's the video. I thought that was homework. <laughs> anyway, okay, the mayor's report. Something that I'm really, really proud of is that we administered over 17,000 COVID-19 vaccines at the Grand Hall at the Old Mill Square from uh, mid-February to uh, basically the end of April, I think it was. Um, that's... Uh, quadruple, just about the population of our city. So we brought in a lot of residents from a lot of different places. And uh, all we ever got was compliments, not only on the facility and the city, but a lot of compliments on how efficiently and how well the vaccination clinics were run. And now, uh, so I have to give kudos to the Alabama Department of Public Health. I have to give uh, kudos to Shelby County and then kudos to the volunteers from Columbiana who helped make those vaccination clinics go so well. Um, so uh, really proud of that. And I think that's something that's really good. So we got a little bit of a, we got a very good update on the SBA loan program and how they partner with FEMA and the difference between what SBA and FEMA does. Um, so I won't cover that anymore. Today, we got some information about, you've heard about the recently passed American Rescue Plan. Uh, information was released uh, by the government today as to what that will cover. It's a $350 billion coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, which is part of the American Rescue Plan Act. Local governments should expect to receive funds in two tranches. 50% at the beginning of May. The guidance just came out today, so I guess we are in the first third of the month. And then the balance will be delivered over the 12 months. So uh, you can see that states are going to get about $195 billion. Counties will get about $65 billion. Metropolitan cities, Columbiana is not one, okay, $45.6 billion. Tribal governments, $20 billion. Territories, $4.5 billion and non-entitlement units of local government, 19 and a half billion. I was gonna look that up. I do not know what a non-entitlement unit of local government is, so I need to understand that. This is the stuff that it can be used for. There's a lot of stuff here. I think there's opportunity here for the city of Columbiana. Uh, we would probably end up tagging into some of this money that the county and the state get. I need to figure out what this non-entitlement, do you know? I don't. I know how much we're getting, but okay. I don't know. You already know how much we're getting? Mm -hmm. How much? <laughs> 800, well, this was the preliminary thing that was sent out several months ago. 
$843,486.47. For Columbia? Because mm -hmm. it's yeah. based on population. Okay. Sweet. So, there's still maybe opportunities here. So, because uh, this guidance just came in. I got this from Senator Tuberville's office today, and the letter from the government was dated uh, today. So, but here's a point. Um, you can invest uh, in uh, capital investments in your municipality. Down here on the line, one of the areas you can use the money for are water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. And the sewer includes both wastewater and stormwater. So that's very, very timely considering the issues that we have had. And clearly in our community, we have uh, we don't have the broadband internet that, coverage yeah. that we really need. So I think there's some opportunities here. Uh, we need to hustle and figure out, uh, get our hands on this money before somebody else does. So we'll, we'll try our best to do that. Um, tornado relief. <clears throat> so let me go back and talk about that. I'm going to, Roberto, so you can see these charts. I had, I had I'm sorry I had uh, closed it down, but I'm going to keep you on mute for just a second. I wanted to first talk about <clears throat> the FEMA guidelines for uh, debris removal. I think that's what most of you are interested in. And so here they are. And basically the overview, it says that this is FEMA guidelines. I want to, I want to qualify that. We're going to talk about, I, like you, I don't like to hear excuses. I like to hear solutions. So what I'm going to tell you is, is what, the, uh, what the guidelines are, what the requirements are. And then we as a city and a community are going to have to talk about what the potential solutions are and the things that we can do. So FEMA guidelines, debris removal from uh, private property is the responsibility of the individual property owner, aided by insurance settlements and assistance from volunteer agencies. Most insurance policies have specific coverage for debris removal, and that is true if it is damaged to a structure on your property, like your home. If a tree falls, it's like the tree falls in the woods, does it make a noise? If a tree doesn't fall on your house, it doesn't get covered by your insurance, sadly. Mm -hmm. So basically, in bold, FEMA assistance is not available to reimburse private property owners for the cost of removing debris from their property. Now, there's an exception to that rule when we, if we should qualify for public assistance. Uh, I, the second bullet pretty much just regurgitates the same one in a different way. But, so here's the thing. If we want to get disaster-related debris removed from private property and get reimbursed for it, the city, individuals will probably not ever get reimbursed for this. But for the city to get it, it may be removed from private property if it's pre-approved by the federal disaster recovery man manager. It also has to be a public health and safety hazard, and it has to be performed by an eligible applicant. Well, what is an eligible applicant? That's the city of Columbiana, Shelby County, et cetera. So if we remove your debris and we can meet these qualifications, there is a possibility that the city can get reimbursed. Based on some case studies and stuff, I still think there are some, some ways where we can get reimbursed without having to really work hard to, to meet this public health and safety hazard uh, test here. Uh, again, regurgitating debris removal is generally the responsible of the property owner. Trees and other property, uh, you need to check with your insurance agent. Uh, I think you all know that. Tree stumps, uh, big this is the big one that everybody's concerned about, as I am. Uh, FEMA does not reimburse for the removal of, removal of tree stumps less than 24 inches in diameter. So it would have to be bigger than 24 inches. So if we can work out a way to be able to pick up those tree stumps uh, with the big root balls, then and we can qualify for public assistance, then the city's going to be able to help out with that. And there may be some other alternatives, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But basically, if it's less than 24 inches, it says it should be treated as normal debris. Um, 
you, you basically, everybody needs to do a couple of things. Uh, first of all, if you have insurance, file for your insurance and do it as quickly as you can. They're probably not going to respond as quickly as you would like, particularly when you have a, a disaster or something like this, they're overloaded and that kind of bogs the system down, slows things down. I know um, my daughter, for example, works for Allstate. She's been working at home virtually for a year and I can't help but believe that that slows things down as well. Uh, but anyway, um, so file your insurance. And as Roberto said, and when we open it up to discussion, he can chime in on this. Uh, go ahead and file for an SBA loan. Uh, you know, take advantage of those contact that contact information that he gave you. The thing is, get the approval process working. Let it cover what your insurance doesn't cover. Get more than you need if you can. And, uh, and like I said, then you only borrow what you need. You know, if you've been approved for 50000 and you only need ten, then once the time comes, that's all you need to, to be able to borrow. If you can't wait on your insurance settlement, you need to move forward with some of these things. You can borrow the money and then you can, you can uh, use the loan to pay it back. And I'll let uh, Roberto talk a little bit more about that and stuff. So... So file for, with your insurance and file for um, uh, an SBA loan if you can, okay? Now, pickup. <clears throat> uh, we just passed an ordinance to codify our ordinances, but we do have an ordinance on garbage pickup. And uh, Basically, when it comes to debris removal from private property, uh, the city will pick that up for you once a month. And that's basically uh, vegetative debris, lawn trimmings, things like that. If you have other debris, uh, or if you need more picked up more than once a month, then that is a special pickup, and you have to request a special pickup. And basically what it says that... Uh, will charge you for the special pickup. That's what the guidelines say. And it says guidelines are set from time to time by the city. So in order to implement this ordinance, we have this city debris pickup guidelines. I'm not going to read it all to you. That is the link to the city's website. If you go to the public works department, um, those uh, guide debris removal guidelines are there. But basically, it's, uh, it tells you, you know, what we normally pick up. You get one free collection a month. Additional service could cost you $50 a load, and that's basically to pay, pay for disposal at the landfill. This is the stuff that it will not be collected by the city. Scrap building materials, demolition waste, dirt, tree stumps, tree trunks, and limbs over six inches in diameter. Uh, let me go back here. Okay, so we've printed. Uh, Alan's got a bunch of those printed up. Um, so I wanted to go back to this debris here. So you see these large tree roots and these tree stumps. The biggest issue that we have there is uh, we don't have equipment that is capable of picking that up. We were able to piggyback on a county contractor to help us pick up a great deal of debris. We were able to pick up a, a piggyback on a county contract to pick up a great deal of debris. And that contract uh, that the county let uh, for that debris uh, removal service uh, ended on the 26th of April. So uh, our city is trying to pick up uh, what it can. Uh, weather has uh, obviously impeded some of that. Our old uh, worn out equipment has broken down and had to be repaired. So what I did is I asked Alan to develop a plan on what he was going to clean up and when. And I know that plan probably has already been impacted by some weather. So are you prepared to speak to that, Alan? Yes. Anybody else needs a copy? I've got some more coffee. As of right now, we started on 47 South and we had to pick none of that up down there on that end of town where they didn't have it piled up when the, the company we had here 
contracted out picking it up. We should be finished with it before launch tomorrow, then we're going to go to the Mooney Road. Anything out there that we can pick up, we're going to pick up as long as it falls within the policy of the city, which means we will not be picking up unless the mayor and the council order tells me to pick it up. Any kind of construction debris is going to be brush or limbs. But like the mayor just said, we do not have nothing that can pick those stumps up. Everything. Then when we get through the Mooney Road, we're going to Gibson Farm Road and pick up anything we can get over there. Gibson Farm Road and Steelwood Estates up, up the side of the mountain. I know everybody's concerned with the stumps and stuff, but at this time, the city just, just does not have the equipment to pick them up. The company that we contracted with, they picked up all of them that they could pick up. Some of them, they, they couldn't even budge off the ground with their equipment. Like the mayor said, the brush truck we've got is a 93 model, and it's, 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 it's running today, but it may not be running tomorrow. I know we've blowed out two cylinders since we've been picking stuff up, trying to make it pick it up. But I, you know, I feel everybody, I can't, I feel everybody's paying what they're going through. I know they want their yards cleaned up and everything and get back to where they look like they did, but. Unfortunately, the city just does not have the equipment to pick it up. I wish we did. I know we have went and picked stuff up or uh, passed the policy when we was cleaning this brush up. The company we contracted with, in eight days, we picked up 15,000 pounds of debris. Plus, we, as the city, had probably done already hauled about seven or 8,000 pounds. So we picked yeah. up. Yards. yards. We have picked up about 25,000 yards of brush. Time the city in eight days, we spent roughly about $125,000 just on picking up debris, not including overtime paying the men out there to work. But we had to monitor the trucks. All right, let me, let me just uh, say one thing. Uh, so vegetated debris is what we can pick up. Um, and what I have noticed driving around, that there is a lot of what we call construction debris, but that's damaged uh, from property and stuff like that. And it's piled up in piles mixed with vegetative debris. Uh, construction debris, excuse me, for homeowners should be covered, uh, the removal of it should be covered by your homeowner's removal insurance, uh, homeowner's insurance. So when you hire a contractor to come in and tear something down and rebuild it, the contractor should haul that debris away. And uh, so it should be covered by your insurance. If they did not, you need to contact your insurance company and tell them to come pick that debris up. If you have mixed construction debris with the vegetative debris, we're not going to be able to sort that for you. You're going to have to sort it yourself, okay, in order for us to pick it up. Um, we have, again, limited resources, but the city is going to pick up this stuff uh, as long as it can. Now, uh, should we qualify for public assistance uh, to get reimbursed for some of the cost of this stuff? Um, FEMA does not pay for that forever. Uh, there will be a deadline set, and we will have to meet as a, count, as a city council, and we will have to decide what is going to be the deadline that the assistance that the city is providing is going to be. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm dragging out my feet a little bit on having that meeting because I'm hoping within the next two weeks we will get that public assistance declaration, and that will certainly help our decision-making process. But in the meantime, we're still going to go out using the plan that Alan just briefed and pick up everything that we can. The other thing that we might consider doing, like with tree stumps, is if we can get some help and find a place to do it. Maybe there are certain places like on Deborah Drive, uh, getting the assistance of a property owner or whatnot, maybe having a controlled burn of, of the tree stumps. And there may be other places as well where we can do that with some of the debris. Uh, it'd be good training for our fire department, you know. So anyway. Uh, there are options that we have, and we're going to conti continue to consider uh, every option that, that we can uh, as a city. With, you know, as what Alan mentioned, as far as what we uh, 
uh, paid for the debris removal and the overtime. You know, we're up around a couple hundred thousand dollars. May not sound like a lot to a lot of people, but for the budget of the city of Columbiana, that is a lot of money, and uh, and it's money obviously that we didn't plan for. The state does not have a disaster fund, and, and neither does the city of Columbiana. So, hopefully. Uh, as I said, FEMA right now initially focuses on making sure that people are safe and secure. And uh, so the individual assistance is only going to, that, that we're currently approved for, is only going to cover that. And then FEMA, uh, if we get to public assistance, uh, then there is some opportunity for us to be able to hopefully remove some more debris because perhaps we'll be able to let another contract. There's a whole there's a whole host of information that I've gotten from FEMA, and they've got this four page checklist of do's and don'ts uh, on uh, public assistance and entering into contracts to remove debris. And most of the things are don't do it until you know for sure what what FEMA is going to pay for. And until we know whether or not we're getting public assistance. Uh, we don't necessarily know what to contract for because we can contract for it and then they get, get reimbursed. So it's a, it's a slow process. Alan, you mentioned 15000 that the city took off. You, I've heard the number, but on the day after the storm, I know the county spent a lot of time on Gibson Park Road, Highway 30. There's no, I don't remember the dump truck loads that they took away from there. There's no there's no telling how much the county hauled off off of just Highway 30 itself. The day after the storm. The day after year. the storm when they started and stuff. Like I said, the city itself, between the contractors that, that we had with the contractors and everything, and us, we hauled off probably about 25,000 yards. And we still, we got about probably 40 or 50 loads back here behind City Hall that we still got to haul to the landfill. Yes, okay. Any other comments from the council? I think it's good to to talk about it in a public forum because obviously when things get on social media, then it can go like a brush fire. I know that's probably a bad choice of words, but um, one disaster to the next. Right? But I think it's important to understand that, and I've seen the comments, I've talked the comments. The city has not received one dime of FEMA grant money, nope. and that money's not sitting in their account. I would wish it was, but obviously that 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 statement is out there. And it's 100 percent inaccurate um if it was they will make these conversations a lot easier mm -hmm. i can assure everybody um but i've had those conversations with people and that is just not accurate um so hopefully we'll be able to get that pretty soon um and put that money to good use so well it's like i had a conversation with one of the residents today he asked if it was true that the city was supposed to do away with the brush policy but we're going to pick up no more brush period and that's not the truth I'm yeah. talking about. somebody's got that started and i'm talking about i think it's a good thing to mention too, in that policy it talks about you know charging uh, a homeowner fifty dollars <throat> i've been sitting up here for nine years and I know for nine years that that fee has never been assessed that, I, done it, that I know of. They've done it just for a few years and they got pushed to the side. Yeah. So, so if you're a, a landowner and you have large trees, you would recommend waiting to see if we get public assistance? Well, landowners, so here's the message, and I'm not going to recommend anybody do anything. The responsibility to remove debris from private property is the, it is the responsibility of the property owner. This is a disaster. This is unusual. Our city is going to try to help as much as we can. Our city's resources are extremely limited. We have contracted with folks to remove as much debris as we possibly could. And we're using the equipment that we have to remove as much debris as we possibly can. And, um, you know, as far as the large stumps, as I mentioned, I'm going to look for other alternatives there. As I said, a controlled burn or something of that nature. I don't know what the alternative might be. The point is, is uh, right now, because we have no public assistance, uh, I'm not going to make any commitments and I don't want the council 
I mean, you can do this. Obviously, it's it's your prerogative, but I'm recommending that the council wait and find out if public assistance is available so that we know what we can do. That's okay. right. And so we're doing all that we can in the meantime. That's that's where we are. Mr. Mayor, can I add to that? This is Robert. Yeah. If I could. Because as you're discussing this point of picking up some of the standard operating procedures, and of course, things I'm, i got to uh, say that every case is different and unique. And so I hear a concern about uh, the removal. And so when applying for an SBA loan, it is about land eligibility, whether or not the land is developed or undeveloped, if it is for commercial use, for private home use. Um, how far from the structure is this debris? Was the debris caused by flooding? So again, there are multiple factors that we need to take into consideration to deem or not the property eligible for assistance in terms of SBA loan money towards the removal of, of debris. Uh, and so my advice, as you were saying a moment ago, um, it is difficult for the city to advise because you're still waiting for that larger conversation about public my advice to those business owners and our individuals, apply with that, with that SBA loan. Make sure that on your application you specify mm -hmm. that it's for debris removal because then the loan officer will start probing questions as to the land eligibility. For example, if it was damaged to land and soil, it may be eligible if this was caused by flooding. If it was the, uh, the flooding that the tornado brought what led to that debris, that may qualify, but that again, obviously, it's a larger conversation and it requires many details that the loan officer would request. If it's landscaping and you're removing debris related to landscaping, whether it is commercial landscaping or home landscaping, that is also a conversation that needs to be had. Uh, undeveloped properties, just as the gentleman was saying a moment ago, I'm a landowner and so I need to know if I may be able to get public assistance for debris removal on a piece of land. Well, the question is, is that developed or undeveloped? Is it for business or personal use? Uh, again, the answer to those questions, depending on your case, may qualify you for an SBA loan, which indeed is an avenue that you can give in consideration if public assistance does not come your way or if your insurance definitely does not cover this. Again, that is something you can apply. No cost associated with applying. You don't have to take a loan at the end of the day. So, Roberto, uh, hold those thoughts. We have basically one more chart I think we need to go through, and then we're going to open it up for public comment. Okay. Okay. Announcements. All right. So, all of the COVID vaccination clinics have been moved to other locations throughout Shelby County. So, there will be some at the Chelsea Recreation um, Center, and then some at on Valley Hill Road. So, those have all been moved to other Location. Um, we'll continue to do Food Truck Thursday every Thursday in May. Um, and then the new City of Columbia website should have gone live Friday, but there was some specific issues, and so it will go live on Wednesday. Um, in May, we have the 15th, which is a Saturday, is Arts on Main Street. That's a joint effort between Columbia Main Street and Shelby County Schools. There will be lots of students in town showing off their artwork and choirs and um, jazz bands performing in the park and on Main Street. May um, 21st, Paul Thorne is at the SCAC Black Box Theater. And then Saturday, May 22nd, Big Al and Heavyweights. Is that your Black group? Box. I was going to say, is that your group? Yeah. The whole May. That's it. That's right. And then on Monday, May 24th, uh, is SCHS graduation, and that will happen. Oh, good. All right. Before we get into the, the public comments, I want to set some. Uh, I want to make a preliminary comment on my own, and then set some rules of engagement. Um, I hope the information that was presented this evening was uh, informative and useful to you. Um, and I will encourage you, uh, you know, it, it's difficult sometimes to communicate with folks 
This information has been on our website for a few days as far as the uh, SBA and the FEMA information. Uh, I think we posted it on our Facebook page. Um, and um, I put out a little memo to go along with some of that information, asked it to be posted on some uh, public bulletin boards, and I've asked that we communicate with uh, the Shelby County Reporter. But again, we don't have a daily newspaper. So I just want to make sure that you tell all your friends uh, to check these places. You know, check the Shelby County Reporter, check the website, check Facebook uh, to get this information. And the, inf the handouts, the flyers that we gave out today, if you can even make more com uh, copies and give them to friends, it has all the contact information. So please use that. I hope the information was useful and there are more resources and more information available to you. Now, when we start the discussion about this, I want to sort of throw out the rules of engagement. When we have something like this, particularly if you're a homeowner or someone who's been adversely affected by the, the tornado, it's, it's an emotional event. But I'm going to ask that when we have these discussions that everybody treats everyone else with dignity and respect and that we attack the issues and not the person who's presenting the issue. So, with that said, I'm ready to open it up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Danny. Mayor, City Council, Department Heads. Uh, Danny Hartzell, uh, Gibson Farm, actually Farm Street. I do know where I live, I think. Uh, we've, uh, we're grateful for what you guys have done. Uh, couldn't have done it without all that's been done. I'm a very grateful first and foremost. Very informative meeting and glad to. We're all here. We benefited. Um, two quick questions. Uh, actually, one comment, two quick questions. One comment is I like the idea of maybe <laughs> you probably had a picture of my tree stumps because I've collected quite a few. If anybody needs them, we've got some to share, but we need to figure out a way how to move those. And it may just be that we hire someone to come in and do the equipment and get that. And that's, that's not a problem, because we've benefited by being a part of this city by what's already been done for us. So we're grateful. Uh, we're willing to absorb that. There are other neighbors who we love and live close to that uh, have got larger amounts of that debris. So they're going to have to maybe incur a much greater expense. So. The second thing is, and my final question is, and we've dealt with this for, for the last six years that I've lived in Steelwood, is uh, the safety of Palm Street. Palm Street has been, uh, you have to oppose to go around the area that's been affected by the trees growing next to the road. Well, the Lord took care of those trees. They're no longer an issue. So now that bumpy bump to where it will actually tear up a vehicle and you need to oppose to go around that section. I would like to see at least introduced into the city, maybe not this year, but at least let's get it on record. Uh, that's an unsafe street. Even though it's 200 yards long, it's unsafe to have to oppose on that uh, traffic. But uh, thanks again for allowing me to speak. Okay, thanks, Dan. Mr. Harsell, I'm sorry, just real quick. When that conversation came up, was it about water lines or something years ago with trees and roots and all that jazz? Um, I vaguely remember that conversation. Yes, sir. Um, there, there was, <laughs> there was a kind of a juggling. Uh, it's on city property. You know, it's not. There are trees. Not had nothing to do with us. I vaguely remember that yeah. uh, But they decided they weren't going to be cut. The city said they need to be cut. But whatever the issue is, it's caused the road to to uh, become a rub board through that. Right. And now the trees are no longer there. So the roots will die, yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. Any other? Any? Yeah. Do I understand you to say that if you get the monies from FEMA for public use, you can then pick up the construction debris? Not construction debris. Well, most of the debris in my yard it's not from my house it's coming well then there's a possibility if it was blown 
into your yard, for example, by the storm, there might be a possibility there. We'll certainly take a look at that. And I think uh, I'll go to what Roberto said. Every case is unique. And that's why when you even read the FEMA, uh, FEMA guidance, it says, in general, this is not covered. In general, that is not covered. So, you know, never say never. Even where it says up there, for example, that it has to be a public health hazard. Well, you've got these tree roots piled up, and, you know, in where we live, you know, it's a, it's a breeding ground for snakes. And, you know, you could have kids playing on them, and they could get hurt. But you could perhaps make a case that that's a public health hazard. So so I think, I, I don't want to say no, but in general, it's, it's vegetative well, debris, and the construction it. debris should be removed by your insurance. But if it's not so your it's debris, your that's another right. story. So, yeah, so we'll have to sort that out. I don't know where it came from. You know, so it's like the I think I'm hearing is, if I want that debris removed, I'm going to have to get it removed. So as of now, we're going to pick up the vegetative debris, but not construction debris. And whether or not we'll be able to do anything beyond that in the future remains to be seen. I don't, I'm not going to make a promise about that. But it's like she said, we've got a chain link fence on our debris. We don't own the chain link. Yeah, I'm, again, you know, and so that's, I mean, that's, yeah. I know it's falling on me, but that's not problem. Problem. Yeah, it's not <laughs> well, the, the chain link fence was probably, probably didn't belong to the city of Columbia either, so, uh, so there is some property insurance. owner that is responsible for that. So, again, um, we're going to have to sort our way through that. So right now, we're going to, we have the ability to remove the vegetative debris to a limited extent. And the county has agreed that we can take it to the landfill at no cost. Um, there's a question of whether there's an whether it's appropriate, and in some respects, even whether it's legal to use public funds to clear debris from private property. And so there are some unique circumstances in a disaster. And so the challenge is is that debris, if it's on your land. We need to get it to the right of way in order for us to pick it up as well. There may still be some opportunity because, again, it's clear as mud, and I'm not the expert in it. But when I read all this stuff, there may still be the opportunity to for an applicant who is eligible to receive public funds to assist with that movement. But right now, it has to be on a right of way in order for. Uh, a municipality or any other public entity to be able to pick it up. They can't come on private property to do it. And as I said, we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to have we don't have the resources. We're not gonna be able to sort that construction debris from the vegetative debris. Uh, so when do you think you might get it? Uh, well, as mentioned, um, the governor asked for a 30-day extension to get the uh, decision made on public assistance. The governor asked for that extension on the 15th of April. However, the requirement is 30 days. Uh, you, you need to do your damage assessments within 30 days of the event, which was the 25th of March. So we had until the 25th of April to do it. I guess the governor realized we're not going to make it, and so asked for the extension on the 15th of April and asked for a 30-day extension. My assumption to that is that she asked for 30 days beyond the 25th of April, making it roughly the, the 25th of May. So roughly two weeks from now, uh, I am hoping that we have a decision that the uh, state of Alabama has been deemed eligible for public assistance for these tornadoes. Right now, we're not. The, the eligibility extends to the state, and then each individual county has to meet a certain threshold. And I understand Shelby County has met that threshold. So the question is whether or not, and it's all based on uninsured property damage. So the question is whether or not the state will meet the threshold. And then if Shelby County, the 
individual municipalities do not have to, to meet a threshold. So if Shelby County meets the threshold, if the state of Alabama meets it and then Shelby County meets it for public assistance, then we would have that public assistance available to help us defray some of the costs associated with debris removal. In the meantime, as I said, we're going to pick up what we can. And what we can't, we'll have to contract for if we can get some assistance for that. Okay, one more thing, Al. Gosh, but um, I know everybody's, like, at this point, they're responsible for their own removal. We've got a neighbor who lives across from Annie and next to me, whose house was sitting on both sides. She's elderly, she's a widow, she has a disabled son in a wheelchair. She has no means, no money. What do you do in place in people like that? I mean, you know, a lot of us have families we can call on or we can dig in our savings, but this lady has nothing. And how, you know, so so how do you say no to somebody who basically, you know, she doesn't she doesn't drive, she doesn't she doesn't do anything but stay, and she's out of her house right now, displaced, as we all are, thinks that any one more person, our whole street's displaced. And so, what do you do with people like that? I, I mean, think the community has help. to come together and figure out how to help that. Where is this address? Uh, she's at the end of Deborah Drive. That was I know they were found housing because I was contacted about them. So I know they, somebody was able to find them housing. Mm -hmm. I do know that. But they say they're going to repair her house. Yeah, I, I've yeah. seen the home. Uh, yeah. Alan and I were down there just the other day looking at it, and yeah. I don't see how it could be repaired either. But, but she, so, so once she does have insurance, which would take care of the debris removal associated with the damage to the home, okay, um, and the vegetative debris, to the extent it was debris that, for example, if a tree fell on your home, let me see if I can go back uh, a few charts here. These photos are a little bit small, but several of the homes here have already been completely demolished. Uh, but if you see the tree on this home and the tree on this home in here, uh, the removal of those trees is covered by homeowners insurance because it, quote, fell on your house. Okay, And the, the removal of the construction debris and whatnot, for example, this house right here, I believe, when we had uh, the group from Northern Virginia in here, Christ in Action, I believe Christ in Action was the one that demolished that particular home and, and a few others, uh, but basically took it down. And again, um, as I said, the construction debris should be, uh, the removal of it should be paid for by a person's homeowner's insurance. And I think that's the message for FEMA. FEMA is here to look out after immediate emergency needs, to make sure that things are safe, you have a safe place to live, and so on and so forth. The SBA is here to, to pick up the slack through low interest loans uh, for what FEMA can't assist you with, from what uh, homeowners insurance can't assist you with, and what uh, local governments are unable to assist you with. So uh, we, when we when we have a case like your neighbor, that's where we have to come together as a community and figure out how we can help. And I know we did a lot of it for the folks out at Nick's Mobile Home Park. Uh, and, um, and I think that's just what we need to do and continue to do. Yes, sir? Uh, Daniel Hallmark, Hickory Street. Uh, appreciate you, Mr. Mayor, and the city council for permitting the time for a discussion of uh, disaster recovery efforts. Uh, I was requested to ask Mr. Baltadano uh, for our Hispanic citizens, um, are there any uh, restrictions, limitations, or any information that they need to be aware of regarding immigration status and their ability to apply for FEMA and or SBA? That's assistance? a good question. Roberta and I talked about this. It is, it is a really good question. And so. You have to be a U.S. citizen in order to qualify for SBA for an SBA loan. Um, FEMA, however, have different parameters. So I would recommend those individuals who have a need still register with FEMA. So long there is a U.S. citizen in the house, you may qualify for FEMA. 
for VA, however, because it involves a financial product, a, a promissory note, and there is a legal process in place, you have to be a U.S. citizen in order to be able to apply for a loan. Thank you. There is a fine line because they speak about uh, a qualifiable alien is the term. Um, that, is, that is difficult to, to explain in a, in a minute, but if you're somebody, for instance, and the easiest example that I can provide is if you're somebody who are who is here in the States with a business visa, so somebody who was granted a visa in order to come in and open a business, you may qualify for an FBA loan. But that, again, is a fine line. There's a lot of questions to be had. Generally speaking, you must be considered to apply for an FBA loan. Roberto, can you repeat that in Spanish? Sí. Uh, yes, of course. And so, la pregunta fue si tiene que ser ciudadano para aplicar para un préstamo de la SBA. La, la respuesta simple es sí. Sin embargo, hay ciertas restricciones y es muy difícil explicarlas en un momento. La primera que se me ocurre es si usted es una persona que está en los Estados Unidos con una visa de negocio. Si usted llegó aquí con una visa para abrir un negocio, un pequeño negocio mediano, puede ser que califique para un préstamo. Pero la regla general es que tiene que ser ciudadano americano para poder aplicar, aplicar para un préstamo. Es por lo que envuelve un préstamo, obviamente, hay eh, eh, reglas legales que hay que observar y una de ellas es que sea ciudadano americano. Okay. Well, we're coming up on two hours. You got another one here? Yeah. Sandra Brown, I live on the corner of Hickory and get some time there. I understand that the felon is going to be picking up what he can. I'm sure there's quite a few spots that they won't be able to pick up. If we decide to go ahead and see if we could contract someone to do this, is there a chance that we would get reimbursed by the city if you get the opening for that? And I don't think you're going to be able to burn it where we are because there's power lines like right there. And all of this is on the right of way. No. We're also no burn order in Shelby County. I understand that. We would have to get a special permit to do a control burn if we could do it. I have to have a question. I know you've got a certain you know, your size limit. If I take the, I got big logs beside the road. If I cut them into smaller sections, can you handle them? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll start that. Tomorrow. And if we get out there for we, we've been cutting some of it up, we could handle it and everything. Just the stump is so hard. Yeah. But if the logs, I mean, anybody else can place everything. Yeah. And a lot of it, we can get, we can get right up beside it. We can pick them up and everything, but we can cut some of them in high for we could handle them. Just give them plenty of fine reason, 19 and 7 Yes. Any other comments? Questions? You said you had the opportunity for the two council meetings. Yes. First and third Tuesday is when we normally have them. We canceled last one because that's when we had the uh, frog strangler. So the next one's next Tuesday. Yes. We won't have any. Okay. Uh, well, it's possible, but I don't know that. And and the information that I got from Senator Tuberville's office, which should be publicly available, uh, I'm going to put that on the website uh, tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. Well, that was the question that was just asked, and the answer from uh, Roberto, I believe, was uh, yes, uh, under certain circumstances. You want to address that one more time, Roberto, about uh, being able to help the Hispanic community? And what was the question? The question was, will FEMA be able to help the Hispanic community? Sure, answer is yes. As a matter of fact, both agencies are able to help the, the Hispanic community because we have Spanish-speaking teams at both agencies. That applies across the federal government. That's the simple question when it relates to language. Now, if it relates to whether or not you're a, an eligible applicant, Will, whether it is for a grant or for a loan, uh, we encourage you to register with FEMA. If you have somebody, and I'm going to give a, a most common example and again, I must say that I'm not a FEMA spokesperson, but I speak based on experience 20 years of responding to disasters. If there is somebody in the house who is a U.S. citizen, that household qualifies for FEMA assistance 
providing the assistance is presented in the name of that individual. Uh, and so it is important for you to reach out and ask questions. Call 1-800-621-3362. That's the number for FEMA. And ask that question to FEMA. You don't have to fear of any reprisal so long you don't provide any personal information. That is a very valid question and one you should reach out to FEMA for because it will depend on the circumstances of your particular home. Now, when it comes to SBA, and this is what the mayor asked me to repeat, you have to be a U.S. citizen in order to apply and qualify for an SBA loan simply because it involves a promissory note and therefore there's a legal, uh, there's a financial instrument involved. Okay. Can you say that in Spanish, please? Can you say that in Spanish, Roberto? Oh. Uh, básicamente, la pregunta era si FEMA le ayuda a los hispanos. Y hay dos partes de la pregunta. Número uno, sí, porque hablamos español. En las dos agencias hay, agente, hay personal que habla español. De manera que si el idioma se refiere, sí, ambas agencias le ayudan a los hispanos. Ahora, de que califique para, para, un, eh, para un dinero de FEMA, el cual no tiene que pagar, depende si en la casa existe un ciudadano americano. De manera que si en su hogar. Existe un ciudadano americano, eh, su hogar entonces puede ser que califique para ayuda por parte de FEMA. Pueden llamar al 1-800-621-3362, que es el número de FEMA, y hacer la pregunta sin necesidad de, de proveer información personal, nombre o dirección, y ellos le van a hacer saber si es que usted tiene a alguien en la casa que sea ciudadano. Ahora, para aplicar para un préstamo de la SBA, necesita ser ciudadano americano, puesto que envuelve eh, un proceso eh, formal Hey, thank you, Roberto. So, if there are uh, any other comments or questions before we adjourn. So, I appreciate your time. I thought it was uh, worthwhile. I have a comment, not about that, before we get On behalf of the U.S. Department, then we would thank the police department for a job well done over the last couple of weeks there. We had the issues going on, and I will go into detail what it was, but. Um, they were like, all, the chief, all the way from the chief, lieutenant down, we've heard from everybody, and everybody's been working. So they wanted the police department mm -hmm. to know that they do work, and that they, are, <laughs> they feel so much better, <laughs> knowing that they've uh, taken care of them for the last several days. Well, we appreciate it, too. So thank you. Uh, so last time we talked about the baseball team, they lost in the quarterfinals. But Wednesday, Ashley and his team were going down to uh, Montgomery. Montgomery, that's great. Playing the, the regional tournament. Regional tournament. Good luck. Play Leeds High School. Good luck, Good to luck. You. Oh, thank you. You going to Montgomery to play Leeds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's up with that? They play. Okay. Also, Mayor. Yes, ma'am. We want to thank the Hispanic community for coming out. Go Lakers be your last time coming. Yeah. When you lay that back, we want you to be here. Because you're a part of the community, you're a part of Columbia. I want to hear you speak Spanish a little bit. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs>